Please turn in Matthew 19, Matthew chapter 19. And also, if you'll turn in that handout to page three at the bottom of the page. <laughs> I direct your attention to Roman numeral eight at the bottom of page three, which says collection of teachings for, that's 18.1 through 19.1 instructions to the church, which we considered in our last few sessions. Now we're coming to nine, narrative five. So these are going to be stories, as we've noted before, stories that are explanatory of things that have gone before or in keeping with the theme of this, the message that's gone before. Now, I'm aware that there's a few people here with law enforcement background, so I hesitate to say it, but I'm going to be bad cop. Henry's going to be good cop, which I thought I'd never say. But uh, what I mean is we've got to cut some things here. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is I'm going to summarize chapters 19 through 23. Now, that is painful, uh, both in the speed we have to go and in the fact that a lot is going to be left unsaid, obviously. And you may have some gem that you feel should have been shared. Well, that's what the night is for in the contribution time. So feel free about that. In any case, you'll notice under Roman numeral 9 on handout page three. It says there, these are stories that reveal what the kingdom will be like. But the question is, do they want it with such a character? In other words, do they really want this kind of kingdom? The Lord has come up against their notions of the kingdom throughout Matthew. And now the Lord's really going to show them that the kingdom's all about the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got to do it his way. You've got to receive it on his terms, not the other way around. So we come to God's word in Luke, I'm sorry, in Matthew 19, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, so there's that literary marker we've been noticing, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So the Lord is continuing the same ministry he's doing, of preaching, teaching, and healing. And we also see, as we've seen earlier in Matthew, opposition continues. So the Pharisees come and test him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Which was a very current hot-button topic in their rabbinical circles, and there were different schools of thought. But essentially, after what we've just thought about in chapter 18, with the necessity of forgiveness and with man's tendency toward unforgiveness, the Lord uh, really comes to the law here and doesn't let man wriggle out of what God's holy standards are. And yet at the same time, we see the Lord showing mercy and the Lord speaking about people coming to him, not people being ex excluded from him. And so we see, for example, chapter 19, verse 13, then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. So you see, even the disciples want to exclude these children. Why? Well, in Eastern culture, the older you are, the more respect you have, the more clout. These children are insignificant. They weren't in the hallmark age where everything is sentimentalism and well, everything's about children. You know, our, our culture, the pendulum has swung so far to the other way that children can do no wrong. It's the adults that are bad. And the children have to teach us what to do. That's what our culture tells us, which, of course, is a lie of a different sort. But nonetheless, when they would say, no, these these aren't worthy of your time. These aren't worthy of coming and participating. The Lord says to allow them to come and do not forbid them. Now, at that point, someone who the disciples probably would have leapt at receiving, the rich young ruler, as we call him, he comes to the Lord 
and says, good rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which again, is one of those sentences that's wrong on so many levels. And the Lord brings him up short. Okay, are you just being polite? Or have you really perceived that the goodness I manifest is the inherent goodness of God? That I'm the son of the living God, and that's why I'm good. Mm -hmm. That one goes right by this guy. But pursuing the other aspect of his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, to get an inheritance, you don't do something. You must be someone. You must be in relationship with someone who does for you. They put you in their will. They pass on to you what they have. It's grace, in other words. It's not earning it. It's not laboring for it. And the Lord, in this discussion with this ruler, as you know, brings him to the part of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as they would call it, the Ten Words, the part that emphasizes their relationship with other people. And the young man takes stock of all those things and says, well, I've done all those things from my youth. Well, if that's the case, says the Lord Jesus, then it'll be no problem for you to sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And of course, we read in verse 22 that the young man, young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And at that, the Lord tells them how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because God's anti-rich, not because the grace of God isn't as effective for the rich as the poor, uh, the grace is available to them. They can come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is, when you have great riches, it's easy for your riches to have you. It's easy for your heart to be concerned with things. Or as Matthew 13 said, the cares of this world and riches and other things come and choke out the word. And so the man goes away sorry and doesn't enter in. The children who have nothing, they're said to be able to come. Come, don't forbid them. The rich young man can't buy his way in and can't give up his stuff. Uh, then Peter says, well, what are we going to get? And the Lord, of course, points to the future nature of the kingdom. He calls it in verse 28, the regeneration, what we would think of as the millennial kingdom, which is a real making new, the new creation is like the new birth, but it's writ large over the universe, over the planet Earth, especially. And it doesn't mean that sin will be removed. There'll still be sin in the millennium, but there's going to be a tremendous application of the Lord's renovating power. And death is going to be rolled back to a great extent. Isaiah tells us if someone dies at 100, it's like they're dying as a little child. And that predatory instinct among animals will be rolled back as well. And the Son of Man is going to sit on the throne of his glory. Then you have, who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So does that sound like a good deal, that here they left their fishing business or their tax-collecting toll booth or whatever their former career was, and one day they're going to be in the inner circle of the governing body of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, in its glor glorious aspect on earth in the millennial kingdom. And he says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many are first will be last and the last first. So the kingdom's not coming on the principles of this world where the way up is to push yourself forward, to climb, to be rich, to be powerful. As the Lord Jesus said at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. The way to go up in his kingdom is down. To say, I need to get low and say that I have nothing and Christ has everything and I must receive it by grace. Which, of course, chapter 20 has a beautiful parable about the workers that emphasizes that very point. That the remuneration is not according to merit or debt, but it's according to grace. And that the last who had only labored a comparative short time were given the same amount of money that the first were. And the first thought they should get more. And yet they had contracted for a certain amount and the Lord had given them that amount. 
So if the Lord wanted to do good with his substance and be gracious, why should they be put out about that? And unfortunately, it, of course, marked out the spiritual the spiritual attitude of the Pharisees, especially of that day. But I suppose we could throw in other religious groups as well. And again, the Lord says in 2016, so the last will be first and the first last for many have called, but few chosen. But even the disciples are caught up in this kind of thinking because it's just then in verse 17 of chapter 20 that we get the sons of Zebedee coming and wanting uh, position. And uh, the Lord, sorry, the Lord tells them again, he's going to be betrayed. Then in verse 20, they come and they want position. They want to sit on his right hand or on his left. And they, of course, are assuming that they're going to come up and enter right into the glory. But the Lord says, that's not going to be how it is. And in fact, it's not like Gentile rule where whoever can dominate others, they get the power. If you get control over other people, you're the boss. No, the way to get power in the kingdom of heaven, to have the authority, is to be the servant of all. And as the Lord says in verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, at that point, as they're coming nearer and nearer to Jerusalem, they encounter two blind men who won't stop shouting, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And that's a great confession they're making of the Lord. One of the great confessions that we see people saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they, the people tell them to be quiet. But these men won't be quiet because they know the only one who can give them what they want is the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to cry out to him. And interestingly, the next thing is that they're going to be going into the city of Jerusalem. And again, people are going to cry out about the Lord Jesus there, but not with complete comprehension of understanding who the Lord Jesus is, even though he's coming into the city and fulfilling scripture, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. Behold, daughter of Zion, your king cometh you lowly and riding on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so he comes in that way. And initially, it seems like the people understand because they roll out their version of the red carpet. They put palm branches on the road. They put their clothes down like they did when they enthroned Jehu in the Old Testament. And they say, they quote Psalm 118 in chapter 21, verse 9. Hosanna, save now, that means, to the son of David, that messianic title. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And it seems like they believe. But the whole city's moved and they say, who is this? And the confession goes out, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Well, that, of course, is all true, but it doesn't go far enough, does it? The blind men had it right. He's Lord and he's the son of David. Not just another prophet in a long list of prophets that God has sent. And the Lord goes up to the temple there, and he casts out the money changers. And again, this is uh, in accordance with Scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came in the temple, and he healed them. So you see, again, the weak and the vulnerable and the indigent, people that don't have resources of their own. They come to the Lord and they're healed. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said, do you hear what these are saying? Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you've perfected praise from Psalm 8. So like the people that told the blind men at the end of chapter 20, be quiet, stop crying out to him. These scribes, And chief priests wanted the ones coming to the Lord Jesus in the temple to be quiet. But he says, no, this is exactly what scripture is talking about. Those who take that place of the babe, the person with no standing, the person who's weak, the person who's poor, poor in heart, they're the ones that receive that salvation. Now, the Lord then curses the fig tree, and it becomes an enacted parable of the future of Israel. It's the only negative miracle our Lord did in his earthly ministry that I can think of. And it pictures Israel. 
because Israel had a lot of profession. They had leaves and looked like they should have had fruit, but there was no fruit on it. And so the Lord cursed it. And it was a picture of what was about to happen to them. Again, they questioned his authority in the temple. And we dealt with that earlier. Since they weren't going to receive the authority of his forerunner, he felt no obligation to give them any further light other than to show their own double dealing with the truth. And he ends chapter 21 with telling them two parables, the parable of the two sons and the parable of the landowner. And the two sons is all about the difference between profession and repentance. You know, in other words, you can talk a good game and say you're going to do what the father wants. But at the end of the day, the one who does the will of his father is the one who, although he initially said he wouldn't do it, he repents and goes and does what his father wants. And the parable of the landowner is, of course, of a vineyard, a picture of Israel used back in Psalm 80, Isaiah 5, John 15, other places in Scripture. And the Lord uh, talks about this vineyard that was prepared with great effort and expense by the vineyard owner, and yet they wouldn't give him the fruits of it. They tried to take the vineyard for themselves, even to the point of killing his son and heir. And that's exactly what they wanted to do to the Lord Jesus. Look at their reaction in Matthew 21, 45. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. So therefore they repented. Well, I wish it said that. It doesn't say that. Verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So at the end of the day, they reject his testimony against themselves. They don't want to hear his word. They want to kill him. But they're afraid to do it openly because of the public. They're held by the fear of man. In chapter 22, the Lord is going to tell the parable of the wedding feast and how there are those that would have claimed, oh, yeah, we want to go to the wedding feast. And yet they have no respect for the father and no respect for the groom. And the one who comes there is just playing games and so is cast out under judgment. And then there was a series of tests put to the Lord Jesus, again, to try to discredit him. As the Pharisees approached and tried to discredit him over the matter of taxes, and the Sadducees tried to discredit him over the doctrine of the resurrection. And ultimately, uh, someone asked him a question, a lawyer, about which is the greatest commandment. And the Lord went right back to the law and showed again. He's not the one who's here to break the law, to get rid of the law. He's the one to fulfill the law. Because the law is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the person who believes on the Lord Jesus enters in to the righteousness of God given by faith of one who himself always did the will of the Father and always loved his neighbor and who calls us to that same kind of behavior. Now, at that, the Lord turns to the tables and asks them a question. Verse 41, he said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? So that was a question earlier in Matthew, going back to chapter 13 and beyond. And they said the son of David. So they knew their Bible. They knew that messianic title. And the Lord here quotes Psalm 110 and shows them that David was talking about somebody who was his Lord who was having personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord God of heaven. And it was told by the Lord God, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So how, therefore, does David, who was the ancestor of Messiah, how does he call this one who's after him Lord? Bearing in mind, again, that the older you are, the more antiquity you possess, the greater your respect in their culture. Finally, chapter 30, uh, 23, excuse me, chapter 23, it's bad enough there are 28 chapters uh, of material that we're not going to cover fully. I don't want to add to them. But 23 has eight woes that the Lord Jesus uh, puts upon the scribes and the Pharisees. And you might say, well, why does he pick on them? Why is he being so mean to them? Because through the whole book, haven't you been reading? Haven't you been listening? They keep rejecting him, rejecting him, rejecting him, rejecting everything he says. 
and proclaiming their own righteousness and trying to act like they're right with God. So eight times he pronounces a woe on them and goes down through their hypocrisy and exposes the pretense of their religion and ultimately shows that judgment, come on ahead, brother, thank you very much, that judgment is going to fall upon them. And the Lord concludes this statement of judgment in verse 34 saying, therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, which reminds us of our Lord's discourse in chapter 10, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. In other words, you're doing what people like you have done all along. I've sent you many different servants, just like in the parable of the landowner, the parable of the vineyard. He kept sending servants, and some they beat, and some they stoned and killed. And God, through history, has sent many prophets to Israel up to this point, and they continue to reject and to slay them, even to the forerunner, John the Baptist. He says, assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come on this generation. The Lord Jesus is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. The Lord Jesus is merciful. Isaiah calls judgment the Lord's strange work. But long-suffering has a limit, doesn't it? And there will come a judgment day, and the judgment was going to fall on them. And at that, the Lord lets loose the compassion of his heart in verse 37 and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when a name is repeated in Scripture, that's a Semiticism, a Hebrew way of expressing deep emotion. He loves this city. As he said in Hosea, Oh, Israel, how shall I give you up? He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And that phrase is used throughout the Old Testament in a number of the Psalms, like Psalm 91, of putting someone under the shelter of wings. It's protection. But you were not willing. It's not an unwillingness on God's part. It's not God saying, well, I sovereignly determined to judge you, full stop. No, it's God who wanted to show them mercy, wanted to protect them. But they were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus quotes Psalm 118. Now you say, wait a minute. The multitude quoted that as well back at the beginning of chapter 21 when the Lord was entering the city. What's he mean you won't see me till you say that? Well, you can say words, of course. But do you really mean that? You know? All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. Is that how we really live every day? Are there times when we get distracted? And we figure all my soul, all that fills my soul is Jesus and this business deal and my family and my friends and this vacation I put or whatever it is. They could be very legitimate, good things. But we let other things come in and, and we often could sing or could quote a scripture and we don't enter into the fullness yet. Well, Israel was saying the right words, but the people weren't ready to receive him yet by faith. There's a time coming in the future when a remnant of Israel will say these words meaningfully, because they'll be about to be destroyed by the Gentiles who have surrounded them. You can read about it in Zechariah 12, for example. And they're going to cry out to the Lord, and the Lord Jesus is going to come from heaven. And that's when they're going to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's when they're going to say, Look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And then they'll be ready to receive the king and his glorious kingdom. Now, I went a little longer than 10 minutes. Sorry about that. But here we are at chapter 24. And so I turn it over to Brother Henry. Well, the first thing I have to say is that I feel myself very weak in Matthew chapter 24. But may the Lord help us and... Uh, 
I hope Keith steps in as he needs to. Now, obviously, this chapter, um, my way of going about looking at this chapter is that it's Jewish. And I think that we look at verse 1, and we see that it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. We have the marker there. The disciples come to the Lord Jesus. And now you have what is called in chapter 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse. You'll notice that in chapter 26 and verse 1, it tells you, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things. So Matthew 24 and 25, Matthew, the writer himself, is telling us is a collection of his teachings. So we come back to that sense of what is the relationship between the narrative section and the collection of the teaching? What is the connection? And as Keith has brought in, the problem is the king. When we went back into Matthew 19, we remembered that there uh, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea. He was making his way into Jerusalem city. He is going to approach and enter Jerusalem city in a way that he had never entered Jerusalem city before. And that is, he's going to enter the city and he's on his way into the city and he is going to um, uh, come and enter in uh, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy as her king. And the problem then comes with all the popularity and the multitudes that followed him, why is it that they rejected him? And I think that that's what Keith brought out. In other words, this is the king. The king rules. This is the king's principles. This is the king's truth. This is the king's way. And, and the nation wasn't prepared for him. The nation wasn't awake. The nation wasn't looking as it should have been looking for his coming. We saw that way at the beginning with what we found in Herod's day. They had the scriptures. Uh, where is he that is born king of the Jews? No interest whatsoever. And so, seeing that the nation is not prepared for his coming, and uh, we're not prepared for the principles of his reign, we come into chapter 24 for the collection of teaching that is then going to teach the nation second coming. So that his coming again in great power and glory does not take that nation by surprise. I think it's important for us to think and remember that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in great power and glory, there's going to be one nation on this planet that's looking for him to come. <laughs> and that nation is Israel. And that's a glorious thing in and of itself. So these are teachings that are given to the nation that missed him at his first coming, did not relate to him, did not understand the, the principles of his kingdom. Again, as we've discussed over and over again, they were looking for a military type leader. They were looking for a Messiah that would put down evil, that would deal with the Romans, and that would elevate Israel to a place of prominence and authority and power over the nation. But there was a problem, wasn't there? And the problem was Israel needed to be saved too. And that takes us all the way back to John the Baptist, the forerunner announcing the kingdom of heaven is nearer than it's ever been. You need to repent. That's for the nation. And so technically, the reason the Lord Jesus is rejected and the reason the Lord Jesus is crucified is because he did not fit the mold of their concepts of Messiah, which takes us back to Peter rebuking him. That will never happen to you. And he goes on and he says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things which be of God, but the things which be of man. So we come here now into chapter 24, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. This is the last time he was ever at the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, I think that to some degree, we've got to think about that temple and how long it was in the building. And you'll remember that really one of the 
most important prophecies that the Lord Jesus gave, if not the most important one, was the one he gave to his contemporaries while he was here. And he said what? Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it again. Why is that so important? Because when we tend to think of prophecy, we're thinking of prophecy 100 years down the road, 200 years down the road, future for a long time. But that was a prophecy that was given to his very contemporaries in that day. You destroy this temple, speaking of the temple of his body, you put me to death, and in three days, I will rise again. So now, he departs from the temple, and the apostles are still uh, overwhelmed with the, the external, the religious. Probably, that was the most incredible architectural construction project that these men had ever seen in their lifetime. My understanding, and I'm not big on this, you know, 42 years it took. Well, apparently, it had been in the, in the building, uh, in, in the construction for over 40 years. So how old were these disciples, you see? Maybe it was all they'd ever seen since they were children. It was the most incredible thing they'd ever seen. And my understanding is that the temple ultimately superseded Herod's lifetime. And so that the very construction of the temple was not even completely complete at this time. It would be completed, but I believe it was around 66 AD, which was but just a mere four years before the Romans would come in and, and, and destroy the whole thing. But you can see why something that was 80 years in the, in the building was for them an astronomical thing. Their Judaism, their city of Jerusalem, the, 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 the sacrifices, the high priest, the whole thing was impressive to them. And they want to show Jesus these things. And the Lord Jesus responds to them, Verily I say unto you, there shall, be not, uh, not, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that had to be a shocking statement to them. And so uh, as he sat, verse 3, upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? End of the end of the world. So we're looking now at timing. They're interested in timing. When? When? Um, the Lord doesn't address it. Luke does in chapter 21. And Luke addresses the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And goes on to say that when the temple would be destroyed, there would be desolations until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the Lord Jesus now is taking an event that would happen about 40 years after this date, right? He was about 30, 33 AD, 30, you know, and about 40 years, the Romans would come in and destroy this, but he is bouncing off of that into the future. And so verse four, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. <clears throat> For many shall come in my name saying, declaring that I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now I'm going to admit that here I have a difficulty. And the difficulty that I have is that the descriptions that are giving us in many ways up to uh, verse 14 or through verse 14 really can characterize what the experience of the church has been here for the last 2,000 years. Say. So I myself am not completely certain, but I think that if we see and, and look at this with a Jewish concept, we're safe. And I say that in the sense that later it's going to be clear that he's talking about Israel and he's talking about the Sabbath and he's talking about things that are Jewish. So let me just then keep reading um, uh, for uh, many verse five and, and, and ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. 
See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So when you look at, even in our life and in our day, and you consider the last uh, 2,000 years, have there come many proclaiming that Jesus is Christ and yet deceive many? Yes. The Pope. I mean, we, you know, many others, right? How about the Joel Olsteins and so on, right? So, again, they, 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 this is par for the course for us. It's almost like if you're reading the USA Today or you pick up a magazine, you're reading things that are happening. And says, now, the next one, verse of 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. If the last 2,000 years have been characterized by wars and rumors of war? Are we living in a day right now where there's all kinds of rumors of war with Ukraine and Russia and the whole thing going on? Yes. But the end is not yet. And that is important because in my lifetime, I have seen tremendous damage done way back in 1988. I was in federal prison and there was someone from Yahoo came out with 88 reasons why Jesus Christ will return in 1988. And I tell you, there's a lot of people that fell for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And people went ahead and some of them quit their jobs and some of them sold the property and some of them did this. And then when Christ did come in 88, what happened to their faith? Mm -hmm. It was disaster, wasn't it? And so again, notice the emphasis, the end is not yet. And then later throughout the chapter, we're gonna get much teaching on the fact that no man knows the day or the hour. Okay? And so how much deception has taken place in the last 2,000 years with people claiming that Jesus is Christ and that they've got understanding as to when he is coming again. How many people's faith has been toppled by that kind of false deceptive teaching? Are we in agreement so far on this? Okay. So then... Um, Verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in all kinds of different places. Is that true of the last 2,000 years? It is, you say. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for not my name's sake. Has that happened during the last 2,000 years? And do you believe that the apostles themselves experienced that kind of uh, opposition and persecution and rejection? And then, verse 10, shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. The book of Hebrews. You took uh, joyfully, right? The spoiling of your goods. You were you 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 were imprisoned, you see, and 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 the divisions that took place within that nation. So is that something that's happened? Yes. Verse eleven: and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. This world is all there is. I would suggest that that's very important. Much of what the false prophets say is linked to that Genesis three lie of darkness regarding the world and the imprisonment of this world that holds men bondage to it as if this world is all there is. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Do we read of that in the epistles? The mystery of iniquity does already work, see? And, you know, uh, even uh, we're hearing, and, and, and we need the exhortation. How many of us struggle with how much time are we spending in the Word? How much time do we spend with the Lord? How much time do we spend in the things of God? How much does the things of God fill our hearts? And, and, and tell me if the mystery of iniquity all around us, if the increase of iniquity doesn't have an effect on your own heart and your own struggle and weariness. What about our children and our married children? And as we contemplate them and our grandchildren, and, 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 and we just see, again, this mystery of iniquity all tied with this world and life in this world. And later, we're going to get that when you come into verse 37, even into a future day, it says, 
But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Do you eat and drink? You have to. You got to work. They're going about what? The daily things of life. When? In this world. See? And Satan is an expert at it. That's why Old Testament Egypt is a picture of the world that John later talks about. And Pharaoh in Old Testament Egypt is a picture of the prince of this world that John talks about, the wicked one. And he's designed this world so that he makes it by daily practical needs of how people need to work, to eat, to live, to pay the rent, and, and, and then he fills it in with the sports, doesn't he? And he fills it in with the entertainment. And, and, and between the mother going to work and the father going to work and taking the kids to have, you know, a, a sport to do and, 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 and the, 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 the need to buy a home and the need to provide. And before you know it, it's almost like if people don't make meeting, do they? And I don't know about you or me, but you know, when I, 30 years ago, when I when I got converted, man, there was activities going on in the assembly almost every night of the week. And nowadays, you know, even the prayer meeting in the middle of the week, it, 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 it's not, you know, it's not good. And yet, I mean, you just can't sit there with a hammer and hammer people. That, that, that doesn't work because ultimately, if the reality of the Lord Jesus, if their faith in the Lord Jesus, if the truth of God's word, if the Lord himself is not sufficient to motivate them to it, we got to be careful how we go about thinking we can do it. So God help us. But then we come back as it was in the days uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking. And you will remember what the problem with Egypt was. The problem with Egypt was, let my people go so that they can worship me, serve me, is the word. Why? Because Egypt, under Pharaoh, the people couldn't worship. The, the, the whole thing was designed. They had no time. And you remember when they started talking about, let my people go, that they might worship me. And, and they came back at Moses. They wanted to stone Moses, didn't they? <laughs> Look what you've done! Right. What did Pharaoh do? He increased their quota and reduced their raw material. In other words, he made life absolutely impossible for them. And boy, do we see this iniquity abound, lawlessness, an iniquity, a lawlessness, a way of living that is separated from the truth of Christ, from the word of scripture, huh? and it is all preoccupied, well, with eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Is there anything wrong with those things? And so as it was in those days of Noah, so does this mystery of iniquity like this, that shuts out the truth of God, shuts out the truth of Jesus Christ, shuts out the truth of the fact that he's coming again in great power and glory. And we need to be saved, and we need to be occupied with him, and we need to be awake and watching and, and, and living for eternity, don't we? And verse 39, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Took them all away in what? Judgment. And so I think that's important because as we read through Matthew 24, it's going to say one shall be left and the other one taken. That's not the rapture. The one taken and the other left. Taken in what? Judgment. Judgment. See? This isn't the rapture. When we're taken, when the Lord comes for his church, we're not taken to judgment. We're taken to Glory. Amen. We're taken to the Father's house. We're taken to be with the Lord forever. So um, it goes on, and it, he goes on that these people preoccupied again with, with the law, increase in lawlessness, mystery of iniquity, the way that Satan's designed this world that we're living in, and, 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 and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken in judgment, and the other left. Left for what? Right? Okay. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, uh, let me just back up for a moment. And then uh, we'll come back here to this verse 42. But as we come back to verse 12, um, um, why are people unprepared? Well, I believe verse 12, 13, and 14 is going to say something to us. <laughs> and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Remember also verse 11, false prophets deceiving many. They, and, 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 and again, that deception back to this world is all there is. This thing about the coming of the Lord Jesus, that's 2 Peter chapter 3, isn't it? And the whole thrust of 2 Peter chapter 3 is that in the last days, scoffers will come saying what where is the promise of his coming for since the beginning all things remain as they are i mean the world's been going on like this for i don't know how many years thousands and thousands and thousands of years and you're talking about some supernatural intervention about jesus christ coming again in power and glory you stupid fools, <laughs> living with a pie in the sky, other world, and an eternity, and a kingdom, and, 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 and catastrophic judgment, and God's going to intervene. All things have been going on, like they've been going on for thousands of years. But Peter says, but this they willfully reject, that the world of old, what world was that? The world before the flood. God destroyed it. And there was a universal judgment that fell. And it was destroyed by water. And they willfully reject the fact that God has already intervened, hasn't he? Catastrophically and in judgment in this planet and on mankind in human history. And they don't believe it. And you'll remember again in the Hebrews 11 passage when it talks about Noah. And what did Noah do? He condemned the world. How did Noah condemn the world? By building an ark. How did the building of an ark condemn the world? <laughs> well, it witnessed to the world that this world you are all living in, and I'm in it, is under God's judgment. And there's only one way of salvation, and it's in this ark. The ark that he built showed that this world was condemned, and men needed to get in that ark. They didn't, they didn't. Why? Because they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and being preoccupied with life here and now. And so iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, but he that endure shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And then verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So what's the reason for their ignorance? What's the reason for their not being prepared? They didn't believe the gospel that was preached unto them. Now, when we say this gospel of the kingdom, are we talking about the same gospel that we preach? Barnabas, when he went to visit the early church, saints. He told them that through much tribulation they would enter the kingdom of God. So again, which one? I, I, I don't know. 
But verse 15 now is certainly Jewish. And verse 15 now is certainly future. And verse 15 is in the middle of the tribulation. And they ask, when, when shall these things be? Verse 15. When? So two things, right? As we've heard before, the gospel. Whether in our age or even in that future day with 144,000 witnesses and so on, the gospel is going to be preached all the way to the end. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Who empowers the preaching of the gospel all the way to the end? The living God does, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus does too. So even during the tribulation period, the gospel is being preached, isn't it? And during the tribulation period, people are going to be saved. And it's a multitude that cannot be numbered. And that's one of the reasons why the judgments that fall during that period don't fall all at once. They fall in stages. Why? Because there's opportunity to repent and be saved. Now we come to verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. I believe that that is when the Antichrist breaks the covenant that he made with Israel, whereby Israel became a religious nation. And this is just me. I believe that has to do with the fig trees, the fig tree. Verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth <coughs> leaves, you know that summer is nigh. This thing about the fig leaves. Remember the first thing Adam did when he sinned? He saw what got fig leaves. Man's works. Man's ability to provide a covering whereby he could stand with God. Back to Israel. What was read the other day, they going about to establish their own righteousness, religion, external, fig leaves. Remember the Lord Jesus when he came upon the fig tree? And what did it have on it? Leaves. But what didn't it have? Fruit. And what did he do? He cursed it. Now, simple question. Is Israel today a fig tree with leaves? What, what do I mean by that? Is Israel today a religious nation? Not at all. It is completely secular. Are we, are we in agreement with that? When they make the covenant with the Antichrist, what will that covenant allow them to do? Apparently build, build, a, build a temple. They'll have sacrifices. And they'll have sacrifices again. Yeah. I don't believe this has happened yet. I believe that's future. And that specifically will happen during the tribulation. And again, it'll happen because the nation will enter into a covenant with the Antichrist. And that covenant that they enter into is over against rejecting the covenant the king made on the night which he was betrayed. And now the nation looks to the Antichrist as their savior, as their messiah, so to speak. And the nation now has a religious character to it. Well, again, the abomination of desolation in verse 15 is what Paul speaks about, doesn't he? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's go there for a minute. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And again, uh, to touch back on the point that many... Uh, uh, will come in my name saying, I am Christ and deceive many. 
Look at the first verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit, watch this verse, nor by word, nor by letter, as if it came from us. Wow. That the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. How is that man of sin revealed? By the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Happens at the middle of the tribulation when he breaks the covenant, goes into their temple, goes into the holy place, and sets himself up there as God. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. It'll be a revelation, a revelation by satanic power and empowerment. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be, notice again, revealed. So whenever you have people that say, I think so-and-so is the Antichrist. <laughs> What's the point? The point is no one knows who the Antichrist is. And no one can know who the Antichrist is until the Antichrist is revealed. Verse 8, and then shall that wicked one, wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy even with the brightness of his coming. Isn't that beautiful? That's what the Lord Jesus comes to do. You see. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, you know what one of the signs of the Antichrist that sets himself up in the temple as if he is God, you know what one of the signs is? Death and resurrection. That's Revelation chapter 14. Go there just for a moment, please. Revelation chapter 14. I'm sorry, 13. Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Right? So this is consistent with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 whose coming is after the power of Satan. It's the dragon that gives him his power. And his seat, that word for seat is his throne, okay? And his throne and great authority. So the rise of this beast, this antichrist, is after Satan. Now watch, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worship, notice they don't only worship the Antichrist. They worship the spirit behind the Antichrist. They worship the dragon, verse 4, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Watch what they say. Who is able to make war with him? This comes back again to the person of our Lord Jesus. 
The big issue in the universe is not one of power. Huh? How does the beast subdue people under him? By his power. And he uses his power to crush anyone who will not take the mark. Tell me, how did the Lord Jesus get you to take his mark? Was it by his power? Was it a gun to your head? <laughs> this is the horror of this world consumed and obsessed with. Wow. And whosoever does not bow to the beast, he uses his power to crush them. He stages a death and a resurrection. What's the difference between this one and the one of our Lord Jesus? Interesting, isn't it? Well, here's the, the, a major difference. One was according to the scripture. This is the gospel by which you were saved. How that Christ died for our sin, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day, rose again, according to the scripture. And what does the according to the scriptures, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to get in trouble here, but technically, what's the point about according to the scriptures? It is prophecy, but I would suggest that the whole Old Testament scripture when it came to sacrifices, the purpose for the sacrifices was for the forgiveness of sin. How did the Lord Jesus win your heart through his death, burial, and resurrection? Because he died, was buried, and rose again for the purpose of the forgiveness of your sin. Blessed Savior, not this one. This one. And so again, he, verse five, uh, this power, they see it. And the reaction is, who is like unto the beast? What's the Old Testament similar phrase? Who is like unto Jehovah? That statement is an Old Testament phrase that ascribes deity. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? His power. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And power was given unto him for three and a half years or 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I wonder if them that dwell in heaven... Is the rapture church? I don't know. <laughs> but it seems to me that how can the event of the rapture not have an incredible, powerful effect on this world? The rapture of the church, the taking away of the church to glory, happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. And it happens before Israel makes the covenant with the beast. That signals the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. Mm -hmm. This is who the Lord will destroy with the coming of his power. There's one more thing here in chapter 13 as far as the deception, and that is the false prophet. And so when you have this false prophet, and you have, and I don't want to get too carried away and all this stuff, but you have this stuff about artificial intelligence. And why do I bring that in? Because that's an issue in our day with these algorithms and so forth, of these machines that know more about you than you know about yourself. I'm telling you, it's dangerous stuff, man. And you have this uh, false prophet and uh, uh, verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb, he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell in the earth to worship the first beast. So you have a counterfeit of the Trinity. You have the dragon, you have the first beast, 
and you have the second beast. And worship is directed to the first beast, who stages a death and a resurrection. I'm telling you, the, the deception that's coming, and God shall send them strong delusion so that they believe the lie. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. See? And so now, this point here, verse uh, 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven. Wow. Who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus and offered a sacrifice that made fire come down from heaven? Elijah. Again, the deception. I'm only bringing these things. Man, I feel so weak in this area. It's overwhelming. But uh, he makes fire come down from heaven in the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, and here's it, that they should make an image to the beast. Now, that's a man-made machine of some kind, some kind of an image of the beast, of which beast? The first beast, which had the wound by a sword and rose and did live. See that? And that he had power to give life to the image of the beast. And that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So whatever that image is, and it's a man-created thing, it has the ability to know whether you worship the beast or you don't. And as many as do not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16, and he causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand, and in their forehead, that no man could buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a, a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. And I go back again to uh, what Keith brought in right at the church. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter says to him, that shall never happen to you. And the Lord responds to him, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things which be of God, but the things which be of men. Not dying in this world, having a kingdom in this world, power and glory here and Well, we go back to Matthew 24, again, that midpoint where this beast is revealed. And then notice verse 16, that let them which be in Judea do what? Flee to the mountain. So where is this taking place? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Israel. Okay. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of a stone, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and warn to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Remember when the Lord Jesus made reference to that as he was going to the cross to the women that bewailed him? But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. What does the Sabbath day mean to you? What is the Sabbath day? Do you work on the Sabbath? <laughs> Do you have a problem running on the Sabbath? It's, this is Israel. This is Jewish. See? For then, there's a time, verse 21, shall be great tribulation, such as was not since, as, as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. What time? Not the time of our Lord, but the time of that event when the beast is revealed at the middle of the tribulation and the last 42 months. For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to that time, say, when the beast is revealed. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, 
those days shall be short. Now, at that point, I want you to just keep your finger here and read Daniel chapter 12, something in verse 2. And I'm asking you in your imagination of your own mind and thinking, putting your head around these things, what do you think that this verse, Matthew 24, 22, will mean to the people, believing people in Israel in that future day? What an encouragement that is, huh? And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Look at one of the things that said to Daniel. And this is a Christophany. It's the Lord Jesus speaking to Daniel. And notice he says in chapter 12 of Daniel, verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up. Wherever you have Michael the archangel, he's always associated with Israel. Okay? And at that time shall Michael uh, stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people, oh Lord, shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. In the book of the Revelation, who's the one who take the mark of the beast? Those whose name are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. And I suggest to you again, during that time, Oh, thank God for his mercy. Not only that, they'll read and they'll hear. Those days have been short. God is in absolute control. And so shall all Israel, when she passes through that time, shall be saved. There's a nation that's going to be looking for his coming. When he comes. Verse 3, 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ. Or there, believe it not. So these are false teachers, false presenting false Christ. Now, this is different than what the Lord said in verse four. I mean, in verse five, that many will come in his name saying he was the Christ. No, this is different now. These are people uh, pointing to a false Christ. You see. Uh, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ. Or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs. We saw in Revelation 14, technically, there's more than one, right? And uh, false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Those, those signs, those miracles that they perform, the strong delusion, you see, Behold, verse 25, I have told you before. Oh, thank God for prophecy. It's what enables us to stand when the time comes. And it will enable them to stand when the time comes. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he, that is Christ, is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Why? Because the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in great power and glory is visible to all. And when that event takes place, everyone will know it. Do we agree? Yes? So, when it has happened, when Christ has returned, everyone will know it. Therefore, don't fall for anyone telling you he's already come. Because when he comes and these prophecies are fulfilled, no one will not know that he has come. And that has much to do with the predator. Pred, what is it? How do you say it again? The pred, predatory? The pre, preterist. Oh, predators. The preterist, you know, that in 70 AD. Yeah. Christ came. The, the reform movement teaches much of that stuff and denies that there is a literal millennial kingdom. 
Christ has not already come because the Bible says that when Christ comes, for as verse 27, the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be a spectacular event that every eye will see him and all the nations of the earth will wail and mourn. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of these days, shall the sun, that's, I believe, the tribulation of those days is after the midpoint of the tribulation. Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light? You read about these plagues and so on in the book of the Revelation. The stars shall fall from heaven. The cosmic powers or the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. I don't know that we know what that sign is. But there's going to be a sign that will appear. I don't know if anyone has a comment on that. But And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see. It's visible. And for a moment, just go to Acts chapter 1, please. And back to uh, that 40-day period in the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you come into Acts chapter 1. And there in Acts chapter 1, it tells us um, verse um, uh, 9. And when he had spoken these things, Remember what he was speaking about. It was an answer to verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the answer is, no, not at this time. What's going to happen now is the Spirit of God is going to come, and you're going to be witnesses to me to the end of the earth. And then he says, verse 9, well, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, it was visible, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their visible sight. And while they looked with their eyes, right, physical eyes, steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You've got a work to do. This same Jesus, those three words are wonderful. What Jesus? The same one that they saw him visibly go. What Jesus was it? The same one that had been on the cross. The same one that was laid on the tomb. The same one that rose again bodily. Jesus Christ rose Bodily from the grave. Jesus Christ ascended to heaven bodily. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner or in the exact same manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Oh, shout hallelujah. The Lord is coming again. And when he does, every eye will see him. There won't be any doubt. Everyone will know. And verse 30, that's back to Matthew 24. It shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven in with power and great glory. And then what we've already looked at, the uh, the harvest at the end of the age, verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. And then now learn a parable of the fig tree. In other words, when you see this nation, this is just being a religious nation, with a temple, with sacrificial rites in Jerusalem, which they, they can't do now. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. In other words, seven year time for all this to happen. Once this happens, it's going to go pretty quick, isn't it? Okay. And so verse, verse, verse how, how quick? Verse 34, for verily I say unto you, this generation, 
And now when he says this generation, what generation is he talking about? Well, the, gen the, the generation at the beginning of, of the seven-year period, that generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, I'll jump down to verse 42. Watch, therefore. And in that sense, does that have application to us? Well, sure it does. Huh? For us, his return is imminent. For us, his return could be at any moment. Amen. And we are to live lives watching. Yes. We're to live expecting him to come to take us home to heaven. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Obviously, for us, his coming is not like a thief that's going to destroy all they have. But the principle of watching is important for us, isn't, isn't it? We, we're not to be ashamed at his coming. And what or how is it that we're not ashamed? Well, we're not ashamed because we're believing. We're watching, aren't we? We're expecting. And then later, as you see in other areas, verse 13, watch therefore in chapter 25, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. But back to then, even in chapter 25, the, 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 the parable of the talents. What was the faithful servants doing with the talents that the Lord had given them? They, they were occupied, weren't they? They were occupied with the business of the Lord. They were occupied with the work of the Lord. So what does it mean to be ready? Because this is what this is all about, chapter 24, for the nation, for people to be ready. Well, it means to be awake, to watch, therefore. Don't sleep. We are no those who sleep. We are children of the day. We, 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 we live in the day. We walk, we're awake. And then in Luke's account in chapter 21, I believe it's verse 36, it says, watch therefore and pray. Prayerfulness. Prayerfulness. And you know the parable in Luke, I believe 18, right? About the, the unjust judge and the widow who kept, kept going, how long till you avenge me? How long will the son of man find faith on the earth when he returns? Prayerfulness is evidence of a vibrant face in the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so the other one is being occupied with the work of the Lord. How important it is that when he come, we are not found ashamed of him at his coming. Verse 44 of chapter 24, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the son of man coming. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler of his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. When we think of the words of the church at the end of the book of the Revelation, huh? and the spirit and the bride say, come, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And our hearts cry out and say, Lord, we want our relatives saved. We want our loved ones saved. We want our grandchildren saved. And I think of John as he was given that scroll to eat. When it went into his mouth, it was sweet to the taste. The coming of the Lord. But then when he, when he, when he, when he ate it, it went into his stomach. It made his stomach sour. Because the coming of the Lord in that sense is a, a two-edged thing, isn't it? What about those who aren't ready? Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank thee for thy goodness that thou art willing to save and that thou art saving still. And we pray, oh God, that every breath we have and to the last breath we have, as thy people here on earth, 
We should be occupied about thy business, Lord, doing what we can to prepare men for that coming. For if it comes them not ready, it will spell eternal disaster for them. We give thee thanks, O God our Father, for the gift of thy Son. We give thee thanks for the Spirit of God inside of us that stirs us and moves us and lusts against the flesh. We give thee thanks, O God our Father, that we're children of the day, and therefore that day will not overtake us in the night as we were asleep. We give thee thanks. We pray, O God, again, committing our lives to thee, our hearts to thee, that we might be a watchful people, a people who are characterized by prayer, characterized by the work of the Lord, the longing for men to be saved, making prayers, intercessions, and supplications for all men. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and that we might be a people, O oh God, that the cares of this world and the cares of this life, even those areas of such importance, might not become so ingrained in us that it takes away our readiness and our expectancy for thy coming to take us home. We give thee thanks, O oh God, our Father, for the Lord Jesus and his coming to take us home to heaven. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 So Matthew 26, I will just say about 25 that Brother Henry already alluded to much of it. And, of course, it carries through, in light of this coming of the Lord Jesus, what is the attitude toward his coming? Or is one ready for his coming? That is brought out very well by the parable of the virgins, the ten virgins. Five were foolish, five were wise. And then we have the parable of the talent, showing us that there's responsibility. And depending on what we think, of that coming king, when I say we, I mean the people that the Lord is addressing, the people that are talking to that age. There's an application to the church now, but specifically those people living in that tribulation period, what's their attitude to the king? If they think he's a hard man, mm -hmm. they're going to bury the talent and not mm -hmm. bother with him. But if they think he's someone who is worthy of investment, they occupy till he comes. And of course, the parable of the sheep and the goats, which is a judgment of the nations and is going to precede the millennial kingdom. There's a lot of misunderstanding about it. It's been taken out of its context and used to say that if we don't help poor people, that we won't be in heaven. Well, I'm sorry, you don't earn your way to heaven by helping the poor or the imprisoned or any other philanthropic work. The issue is, What's their attitude toward the Lord's people? What's their attitude toward the persecuted remnant of that age? Amen. Do they identify with them because they know the king is coming? Or do they neglect them and reject them? Because again, just as in the church age, how you, how you feel toward the king, how you feel toward the Lord Jesus is going to be how you treat his people as well. Amen. Now, Matthew 26, now the king... That, that verse, no, no. <laughs> just read that verse 40. I think there's, okay. can you? Yeah. 25. 25, 40. And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Wow. And of course, my brethren gives it away. That's right. There's not a universal fatherhood of God and a universal brotherhood. For all creatures, we all we are all also his offspring, as Acts 17 reminds us. In other words, we've been created by God. But to be a child of God and to be linked as a brother of the Lord Jesus, this is to be a believer. Now notice Acts in Acts, Matthew 26, verse 1. Matthew 26, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples. So there's that literary marker. The last sermon of the five is done. You notice the progression. We started with the Sermon on the Mount. 
the kingdom promised, the Lord describing what it would be like. And once we get to the last sermon, the all of the discourse 24 and 25, this is the kingdom come. This is his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And now the Lord's going to get back to a real-time historical account. And he said to his disciples, verse 2, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Mm -hmm. So again, our Lord isn't approaching Jerusalem blindly. He has perfect foreknowledge. In fact, other scripture tells us he said his face is a flint to go there. Amen. He's purposefully going to lay down his life on the cross. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, chapter 26 in this first part, for the first 46 verses or so, is going to toggle back and forth between the Lord and his, and those who are adversarial toward the Lord, those who are his opponents, or his enemies, we might say. So notice, you've had the Lord and the disciples in verse 2, now verse 3, then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. So the plot is still going on to get rid of Jesus with all the evidence, all the miracles, all the works of mercy, all the preaching and teaching and healing. They've not repented. They're inveterately opposed to Christ, and they want to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because when did the Lord Jesus die? On the feast. During the feast. Right. <laughs> so again, they're afraid of what will happen with the people. But for all their supposed power and their preparations, it's not going to happen when they dictate, but it happens when the Lord dictates. Amen. Now, again, we toggle over to the Lord and his. And this is actually a, a story that is out of chronological order. We know that by John 12 which tells us it was actually a week before this incident. But it's put here by the Holy Spirit to make a point. Because even as people are plotting to do away with the Lord Jesus, there are people gathered around the Lord Jesus, and one woman in particular, she's anonymous in Matthew, but other Gospels tell us she's Mary of Bethany. And she takes this ointment, very costly, I'm sure you've all heard messages on it, read things on it, probably preached on it yourself. And she has poured out this very costly ointment and in the process is completely misunderstood, especially by the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, because this is cutting into his profit margin. He's the one who is embezzling funds. But also the other gospels tell us the other disciples were carried away with what he was saying too. And yet the Lord Jesus says, why do you trouble the woman for she has done a good work for me? For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. So even as they're plotting to kill him, the Lord has ordained one of his sensitive servants, this dear lady, Mary of Bethany, comes and prepares him for his burial. And as we saw earlier, this is something Mary Magdalene doesn't get to do. This is something... Um, this Mary isn't going to be at the tomb on that first Resurrection Sunday. And none of the disciples get to do this. This is uniquely uh, what she does. And wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told in the world. You notice she says nothing, by the way. Amen. The world would Amen. say, you know, how do you put up with the oppression of men and the chauvinism? And yet we're here celebrating her as one of the Amen. choicest Amen. saints of history. Amen. Yeah, don't start. Then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, you know, the price of a slave. From that time, he saw an opportunity to betray him. So Judas is seeing the gravy train from his point of view is ending. He's not going to have this end in Christ ruling in glory and him get rich. So he sides definitely with those who want to do away with Christ and he covenants to betray him. Now we get back in verse 17 to the disciples. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus. By the way, Passover and Unleavened Bread, as I mentioned earlier, were at the same time, 14th and 15th respectively. So by the time of the New Testament, 
that phrase unleavened bread referred to the whole holiday time period. It's like this and New Year's often when we use that kind of expression. So they come and ask him, where do you want to go and prepare the Passover? And the Lord already has it prearranged, which of course indicates his kingly authority. He says, assuredly, verse 21, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Now, actually, Greek has a way of asking a question, a couple different ways. You can ask a question presuming that the answer is yes. So supper's at 5.30, right? 5.45. It's 5.45? Yeah. Okay, but you just killed my illustration. <laughs> Great. Great. So, 5.45, right? I've asked the question, and I'm presuming now that I know that that's a corporate at 5.45. Well, that's kind of in between, right? I'm not saying whether I think it is or isn't. I'm not sure. I'm asking. But if I say, surely supper is not at 5.45, is it? Yeah, then you say, okay, I don't believe it. And that last way is how they phrase this question. You can see it, for instance, in the New American Standard Translation. They say, surely, not I. Now, to their credit, they're troubled. The idea of betraying the Lord, that's just a terrible thing to them. They are loyal to the Lord. They love the Lord. And the idea that one of them would betray him, they just can't believe it. You know, it's just kind of blows their minds. But their response is overconfidence. Their response is thinking it's not going to be me. Now, how many preachers beat up Peter? And admittedly, Peter fails egregiously, and we see his feet of clay even in this passage. But you got to understand, it wasn't just Peter. They were all like that, except for Judas, who knew it was himself <laughs> and had the temerity to say to Jesus in verse 25, Rabbi, surely not I. And Jesus says, you have said it. I it said, doesn't say Lord. No, that's true. It doesn't say Lord. That's an interesting Never point. Never recorded right. that yeah. he ever called him Lord. Good observation. No, no. That's, a, that's important yeah, and good yeah, stuff. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's true. Teacher. Yeah. He's a great teacher. Amen. <laughs> it falls far short of yeah. what he is. <laughs> now, it's interesting in retrospect, you can see this in the different Gospels, John 13. There's a fuller account of how the betrayer is marked out. And it's a very touching way. I would refer you to David Gooding's book, uh, In the School of Christ, that talks about the upper room ministry of Christ. And he brings out beautifully how the Lord exposes the traitor in a way that, looking back, the disciples could tell. Jesus wasn't taken by surprise. He knew this all along. And yet, at the same time, he was telling Judas, you don't have to go through with it. I still love you. No, I refer you to that book to find out how that was so. But even here, they could look back and they could say, you know, the Lord knew it all along. I mean, also in John 6, of course, he says, have not I chosen you 12, and yet one of you is a demon or devil, the old translation. The Lord knew from the beginning who would betray him. And he answered and said, he who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, that's extraordinary. The thought of breaking bread with somebody, getting up close and personal with them at table. And the phrase in the New Testament in the Gospels is to recline at table. Mr. Darby often renders it that way. That you're, it's like a Moroccan restaurant. If you've ever been to one of those, you sit on these low couches. They're fantastic places. And they have these low tables and they bring out this big platter of food or a big bowl of something. And you've got your little space there and you dip your pita bread in or whatever you have as your substitute utensil and you grab a bit of the food and you eat. And Henry's over here in his space and he's reaching into the same platter eating with me and somebody else. That's why it's so important when the whole matter of washing feet comes up in John 13. Because they're reclining on their left arm, eating with their right. Because in the Middle East, you don't do things with your left hand, except for dirty things. Enough said. In any case, 
They're there eating at this table, not like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, as if they're in Venice or Florence in the 15th century. They're reclining close together. John is called the disciple who reclined on, who leaned on the Lord's breast, not because John is some kind of sissy. No, he's a son of thunder. Don't mess with John, he'll pop you in the nose. You know, I mean, Lord, shall we call down fire when the Samaritan village wouldn't give them a place to stay? I mean, he was all about judgment. No, when it says he reclined on the Lord's bosom, he could sit next to the Lord. He was close enough. He could lean over and speak to the Lord like this. Okay. Gordon Franz, by the way, brings this out beautifully. If you've ever heard him on the position of the disciples at the uh, Last Supper. In any case, this is an image of the sweetest, closest, most intimate sort of communion. And here the Lord's telling them, somebody in the close inner circle here, somebody who's in this sacred bond of friendship that I've shared my food with, that I've led, that I've kept and protected and not allowed anything to happen, that I've provided for. Someone who's participated in my miracles even is going to betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. So again, this is that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But he says, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now think of that. The Lord is saying this in compassion. If they were me, I'd say, well, that dirty rat, he's getting everything that's coming to him, you know? You're going to get judged for this. Yeah, you may have your day, and God's using it for his purpose, but you're going to get judged. And the Lord doesn't rejoice in that. You know, this is the God who the Bible tells us takes no delight in the death of the wicked. So is he going to judge the wicked? Is he going to judge the impenitents, those who refuse to repent and believe on him? Yes, he will. But he doesn't rejoice in it sadistically. He doesn't exult in the destruction of a creature that is create that he has created, whom he wanted to be in his family, whom he wanted to have fellowship with, whom he wanted to bless. And he says the thing Judas is going to do is so bad, it would be better if he had not been born. Now, at that juncture, the Lord, uh, it says, as they were eating, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And it's difficult to tell here. You have to really compare all four Gospels to get the chronology of the thing. It seems that Judas goes out before this point. And the Lord institutes this Lord's Supper. And we read in verse 27, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the Lord is leaving them something that is speaking of the past, but also of the future. Speaking of that new covenant, which he would make by shedding his blood there, by giving up his life sacrificially that they might be his people and he their God, that they might know him, that they might have his spirit write his law in their minds and hearts, and that their sins and iniquities they will remember no more. Is it made with Israel, as Jeremiah 31 says? Of course. And there's coming a future day, as we thought about in Matthew 24, when that believing remnant of Israel is restored, when the nation is ready to turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to come and rule among them, and it will be on the terms of the new covenant. They will be his people, he will be their God, and so forth. But already, we enter into it. And every week when we put out those symbols, we think of it, this relationship that we're in with the Lord. Not only what he did for us, that's part of it, of course, and not only the fact that he's coming again, that's part of it too, because uh, he said, do this, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 says, do this until he come. Goodness. So we're looking to the future that was coming again. But in the present, when we're sitting at that Lord's Supper, we're saying, Lord, you are my Lord, first of all. And it's not a place where I come to get entertained 
or get my needs met or the itch I have scratched, so to speak. I'm coming to remember the relationship I've been brought into with the living God and to make sure that I'm going along with the terms of this covenant, that your spirit is writing on my mind and heart is law, and I'm not hindering him from doing that. Now, we're told in the New Testament not to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit in separate verses. We can hinder that work, can't we? We can get in the way of the work God is doing in our life. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation, but we certainly don't make progress when we do that. And we bring on ourselves chastening, even as those in Corinth did in 1 Corinthians 11. So anew, we remember who the Lord is. And we remember that his kingdom is coming on earth. And we've already entered into it in a sense, in the sense that he's already our Lord. And we're already part of the church. And the church is going to rule and reign with him in the future. So all of this speaks to that. But as far as drinking of the fruit of the vine, prayers for the Sabbath, the Shabbat, as they call it, is something of joy. Wine in the Bible is associated with joy. Psalm 104 says you've given oil to make man's face shine, bread uh, for him to eat, and wine which maketh glad the heart of man. Song of Songs 2 says, you brought me into your banqueting house. Literally, the phrase is your house of wine. You've brought me into your house of wine, or he's brought me into his house of wine, and his banner over me is love. And we think of John 2 even, where the Lord turns the water, those empty pots that represented the ceremonial cleansing of Judaism. They had to fill them up. And then the Lord took what was mundane, and he turned it into something joyful, turned that water into wine. But for the Lord... He's going to become the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And there's a sense in which the Lord's life is one of fasting, one of mourning, one of being persecuted, one of being attacked throughout his life. But now that we come to this section of Matthew, we're entering into the depths of his sorrows. And it's going to be down, down, down from here. Yes, one day that kingdom will come. Yes, he's going to rule and reign in glory as that king, as we've heard. But right now, he's going down, down to the humiliation and the awful death of the cross. Now, when they had sung a hymn, Brother Paul, you would have enjoyed it there. Brother Paul loves good hymns and does a good job with them. So thank you, brother. I'm just glad we didn't have all 19 verses of Emmanuel's land. <laughs> but anyway, that was a beautiful hymn. I appreciate your, your love of hymns. They sang a hymn, and then they went out to the Mount of Olives. And some people think that the hymn was part of the great Hallel, which is a section of the psalm, Psalm 113 through 118. And if that's true, you can't prove it dogmatically. But if that's true, because that's what they sang around the Passover time in the first century, then the Lord would have been singing these words. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Amen. Yeah. So the Lord is coming to that day of laying down his life. And in spite of the sorrow that that's going to mean and the suffering and the pain, the Lord, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, Amen. as Hebrews 12 Amen. tells him. He says, verse 31, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, as it is written. So even in the disciples' failure, that's not something that takes God by surprise. He's already said it in the scriptures. It's from Zechariah the prophet. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Shepherds in that day led their sheep. They didn't have to drive them and beat them. They went before them. And they met the enemies ahead of them, if there were any. And the Lord says here, I'm going to be smitten and you're going to be scattered. But that's a temporary state of affairs. I'm going to go ahead of you and gather you. And that's what the Lord does. And here Peter says in verse 33, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And he says it as emphatically in the original language as one can. But the Lord says to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. 
And so said all the disciples. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not just Peter. All of them are approaching this event. And they're it's sort of like they're saying, ah, I can't hear you, can't hear you. Every time he's talking about suffering and dying. They don't want to know that. All they want to hear about is the glory. All they want to hear about is the reigning. All they want to hear about is the celebration. And we always have to remember that it begins with the cross, doesn't it? Even in the Christian life, as we've learned, we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, you know, you've reigned as kings without us. And I would that you did reign. I wish the millennial kingdom were here yeah. and the Lord Jesus was in Jerusalem because my life would be a lot easier in essence, Paul was saying. But this isn't the time for us to reign. This is the time for us to identify with him. What Paul called in Philippians 3.10, the fellowship of his sufferings. And of course, along with that, we get the power of his resurrection, which enables us to go through that. Now we have the Lord's three prayers in Gethsemane there. And it's amazing the contrast that whereas they don't know what's coming, they're oblivious, it's a culpable ignorance because he's been telling them. He's trying to get through. But in the garden, you realize he knows exactly what he's going into. There's nothing about Calvary, nothing about Golgotha, the cross, and the suffering there, and being made sin for us that the Lord isn't seeing ahead of time and knowing exactly how awful it will be. Mm. And the prayer in Gethsemane shows us that uh, without a doubt. And yet there's not even anybody there. It's the beginning of separation for the Lord. He goes a little farther than where the disciples are. One of the gospels says a stone's throw. Now that was a measure of distance. But when you think the Deuteronomy 21 talked about bringing a rebellious son before the congregation and stoning him saying this son of ours is stubborn and he's a glutton and a drunkard and he won't listen to us, he won't repent. And the Lord Jesus is the exact opposite of that, is the, the obedient son. And he's going to die under the wrath of God for us yeah. as a substitute. And yet even in those prayers, he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. They couldn't enter into what he was entering into already. They couldn't address the matter of that cup of the wrath of a sin-hating God against sin. And the Lord only could do that. And so we begin to see that progressively from here on out in Matthew, the Lord gets more and more and more alone until the resurrection. And thankfully, we're going to end tomorrow with the resurrection and the Great Commission in chapter 28. But when we come back after supper, we're going to see something of the trials and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, after that, we'll have a time for you men to contribute. Let me go on. This is one little question for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know that Jesus is up in the mess. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Have you ever thought of God the Father or something? Sometimes you say, God, mm -hmm. this is hurt me more than this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking it's the first in uh, Romans 3. God's thoughts of his stuff. When God sent forth a propitiation by his blood, faith, demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had, had passed over since the previous week. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate the presence of his righteousness. He might be just, and disavow the one who has faith in him. Amen. So I just thinking of in his forbearance, yeah. All the sins, yeah. He's put us, put us back to it, yeah. I said, I'm just so much. You saw him here. Well, I don't think God suffered. Amen. Ze Amen. Ze Zechariah 12 10. Yeah. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. And of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Yeah. Certainly, that's the heart of the father. And another one would be David with Absalom. When he says, Oh, Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God I 
could have died. But, uh, yeah. it, 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 and, it, and Romans 8, uh, he was spared uh, not his son, uh, but delivered him up for us all. Yeah. And of course, that's, we think of Genesis 22. They no, went, no. both of them together, together. it says Amen. twice. And yet I am not alone, yep. he said, Amen. John 16, for the Father is with me. Amen. Good point, yeah, brother. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I know there's always more to be said, even if I had five hours on this passage, we wouldn't begin to scratch the surface. But let's pray. Father, we're thankful <clears throat> that nothing is out of thy control. And even when on that same night, Lord Jesus, when all around thee joined to cast its darkest shadow across thy holy mind, we think of that group of people that were plotting against thee, and yet, Lord, thou didst know it. It didn't take thee by surprise. And nor was it even a human idea for the Son of God to die as the Lamb of God. They couldn't imagine that. All they were trying to do was commit murder, to get rid of bothersome Jesus of Nazareth, as they thought. But God, even the Father who loved his Son, would lay on him the iniquity of us all. <clears throat> and we think of thee as the righteous judge, Father, pouring out on him what he never deserved, what we deserve. And we thank thee that we've been given what we don't deserve, even eternal life, and sharing with him in glory. We thank thee for this. We pray for the food we're about to have. Help us to have good fellowship over it. And thank thee again for the dear ladies that have been laboring so hard for us. We pray it in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.